MOU Game Center Lecture Series, and uh, very excited to have Austin Walker with us tonight. Um, as, uh, as always, a uh, big shout out to the sponsors who help make our event series possible, uh, Fresh Planet, Take Two, and Dots. Thank you very much to those uh, generous folks. And uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, super excited to, uh, to have Austin here. Um, he is a writer, a thinker, a scholar, uh, working in the realm of culture and politics. Um, after graduating uh, from uh, uh, grad school with a, with a, a master's in, in arts and politics, he, he went on to uh, join the uh, illustrious crew at Giant Bomb, the, the popular game uh, journalism empire, um, where he was for a while um, until he was uh, tapped by the smart folks at Vice to come and uh, head up their new uh, game-focused uh, site, which is Waypoint, where he is now the editor-in-chief. And uh, he's here tonight to talk about uh, um, a wide range of topics, but uh, with a focus on on how to think about uh, games in in the contemporary era and their relationship to uh, the world around us and and to politics and to our place in in history. Um, so please join me in welcoming Austin Walker. Hi. How's it going, everybody? It got kind of cold again, which I'm not a big fan of. I'm going to set up my iPad. I'm going to continue my long, illustrious career of not having any slides and instead reading things off of, uh, of a computer. I don't care what Apple says. It's a computer. <laughs> so first of all, uh, I just wanted to say thanks for coming out. Uh, it is Packed. I heard a number of times that it sold out, and then they added more tickets, and then they sold out again, which is a good feeling. Um, it's pretty uplifting, uh, and I say uplifting because, uh, you know, it has not been a great time in the world uh, lately, you know, across games, across media, across politics, across everything. Um, and I think, like, that has been consuming a lot of where my mind has been at while I was prepping to give this talk. Um, you know, I, I, as Frank said, I did my master's at uh, CalArts uh, in aesthetics and politics, and so I spent some time doing PhD work, which I did not finish, uh, at the University of Western Ontario, and that's where I taught the most. And just about every year at the end of the, the semester, at the end of every semester, I had a number of students who would come to me and, and say, hey, like, who do you agree with? Which, which of the philosophers, which of the media critics, which of the sociologists that you've read or that, that we've learned this year do you line up with? Um, and, you know, what I always said was, it depends on the day that I'm having. On a good day, uh, I felt like I connected to uh, Walter Benjamin, the, the philosopher, uh, the, the German Jew who, f who, in fleeing from Germany during the rise of fascism there, was unfortunately killed. Um, Benjamin was a storyteller who once made experimental children's radio shows. He was a mystic who rejected teleological, even linear, views of history and instead believed fundamentally in the possibility of possibility. Uh, he was also a pragmatist who, who saw uh, the need to secure, quote, rough and material resources that everyone's life needs, but who also championed uh, the symbolic, who, who understood that we needed victories that were not just about grain and rice, not just about money, but also about uh, symbols and, and about rhetoric and about the, the power of belief. Um, he, you know, understood most firmly that uh, the way in which technology could open up new means of communication, and, and he saw and attested to the ways in which uh, the Nazis in Germany used technology to uh, aestheticize politics and to create a false and disastrous image of what Germany could be. Um, in fact, he made his most famous call to action, saying that if fascists would aestheticize politics, making domination beautiful, hiding genocide behind respectability, then we have a responsibility to uh, politicize art. That's me on a good day. On a bad day, I feel a lot like Adorno. 
Uh, Theodore Adorno, another member of the Frankfurt School. Benjamin wasn't really part of the Frankfurt School. He's sort of like, like when a wrestler like, teams up with the NWO or the DX like, all the time, but he doesn't, doesn't actually wear the t-shirt. So Benjamin was like, adjacent to, to uh, the Frankfurt School. Adorno was like dead center. Like, he never left. He wore the t-shirt even after the stable broke up. Uh, and, and Adorno is someone who is just like a depressing person to read. You know, the, the Frankfurt School in general kind of blended Marxist and, and psychoanalytic thought uh, in order to try to analyze why Nazis came into power in Europe, why fascism came into the rise. Like, what were the conditions and what were the psychological and material causes that allowed these theories to come to pass? And after fleeing Europe, uh, Adorno came to the States and was like, yo, Hollywood is bad, <laughs> actually. Uh, Hollywood is doing some bad stuff. And, and most importantly, the culture industries of America and the West were convincing people that they, that they had uh, the ability to be individuals in a world in which individualization was false, in which through purchasing things, through identifying with Hollywood movie stars, they could be unique, ind independent people, when in fact they were being shaped daily by the same culture industries that, were, uh, th th that Adorno was studying. Um, Adorno is a frustrating figure. Uh, you know, he's someone who, when he listened to the solos and syncopation of jazz, could really only hear the, the cash register chimes that decorated what he thought of as an oppressive form. He, he couldn't value the black history of call and response. Uh, he, he could not, uh, uh, he didn't take a step away from the popular swing uh, music of his era to learn about the expressivity of, of you know, bebop musicians and other experimental jazz musicians. Uh, and, and he was so dedicated to uh, overcoming this notion of, of complicity in this system that he didn't find any familiarity with those in the margins finding some way to express themselves in music. He just sort of hated everything. Um, and underneath that, there was a hope, he would say. You know, he, he wrote a lot about living a damaged life, quote unquote. And I mean, listen, he is a German Jew who escaped the Holocaust and came to the States to be a politician, or to be a, a philosopher, not a politician. Uh, and, and I get it. Like, there is a, I get the, the pessimism there. Um, so coming into this talk, I've had a lot, of, a lot to think about in terms of where I've been at. What sort of day am I having? In thinking about that, I thought a lot about two years ago. Uh, I stood like right here two years ago, not to the day, but in 2016 for the different games uh, convention, and I, I gave a keynote there, um, and I was pretty positive there. I laid out what I thought was a pretty hopeful program for resistance. I spoke about the value of marginalized creators, and I spoke about the politics in games like, of course, Far Cry 2 and The Division, uh, and, and I made the case that one of our most powerful tools uh, was political and cultural incoherence. Um, that, that art that rallied, or that, sorry, art that railed against the norms that commercial entertainment so deeply installed into the audience had a chance of affecting that audience. Work that loudly undercut marketplace expectations, that provide new counter coherence for those on the margins to find refuge in, and which drew the, the non marginalized so called normal, normal player uh, into uh, out of their reclined position where they're very comfortable and into kind of an uncomfortable and engaged one where they go, like, ah, oh, this doesn't feel good to me. And that like turns on their brains in a way that forces them to engage with the material at hand. Uh, in my closing, what I said was, um, what we do will be dismissed as incoherent until it is finally appropriated. One of my big concerns is that even when we make really radical art, eventually a big business comes in and goes like, oh, cool, we can make that for less and sell it to more people if we just chop off the rough bits on the edge. Um, I continued that we must at the same time still be incoherent. We must keep going, keep reinventing ourselves over and over again in our creative work. It's not enough to demand broader representation in established paradigms, uh, and we should be especially wary of conflating our, conflating our own successes with proof of change. We should continually search for new lines of flight, new platforms to broadcast in, new genres, and new deconstructions of old genres. Despite the risk of dead ends and appropriation, we must be radically incoherent and occasionally a little utopian. Two years is a long time. It's long enough to see a dark mirror of Benjamin's call to action. If we aimed to shift politics by making incoherent art, art that undermined a normative understanding of justice, beauty, and life, then what we have been faced with is a new string of fascism across the Western world that has replied by doing the exact same thing. 
The Nazi propaganda program was designed to provide an alibi for the most heinous of policies. And today, there remains a sort of alibi making. For instance, take a look at the detention and deportation tactics of ICE and, and how they find popular support because of an effective PR campaign that erects an image of gang violence and drug, and drug traffic and erases the material cost of their actions. You know, you talk to the average American who, who doesn't know much about immigration and deportation, and in their minds, you often won't find the, the image of families being split up or knowledge about how much is spent by many of these families uh, in trying to actually legitimize their immigration. Um, you, won't think, you won't find uh, the knowledge of how many people would be impacted by a repeal of DACA, or uh, what you will find is a number like 800,000 or 600,000, but not a number that accounts for all of the people whose lives will be touched and harmed by the deportation of that 800,000. But alongside that alibi making, which still exists, there is a nihilistic sort of incoherency, not the sort of belief-driven incoherency that I petitioned for a few years ago. This one is poisonous, and importantly, it is much easier to perform. Where we have the job of converting our lived experiences and our personal and political concerns into art, hashtag MAGA crowd, the hashtag MAGA crowd simply needs to disagree with any argument that's made. They don't need to construct an argument. The volume of disagreement is enough. In fact, because it is a politics of negativity, that is, a politics of response and uh, removal and denial, they explicitly avoid making any sort of statements and instead simply make incoherent responses. When confronted with a claim about the human cost of deportation, for instance, they simply reject that the cost is severe at all. America is doing these people a favor by sending them home, they'll say. A day later, if confronted with evidence of that cost, they will smoothly and calmly deflect and say, now that their, their concern isn't about helping these people, it's about reducing harm to other Americans. And if you present another argument after that, they will continue to deflect and dismiss and never offer a, a firm counter-argument that is about any sort of core ideology. Dismissal is the point. Um, at some point, you will, of course, just be told that you are a conspiracist or that you are being paid by some other conspiracist or that you're a fool for, ironically, believing in authority figures. We have the benefit of belief. Uh, it's, it's powerful to believe in your experience and to believe that others uh, deserve and, and need to have their experiences shared and that we should make art that reflects the real lived diversity of experiences in the world, ranging from you know, uh, someone like me who's a, a, a biracial academic who somehow wound up at Giant Bomb and then at Vice, to, to you know, the, the amazing lives of, of trans creators in our spaces, to the amazing lives of, of those in poverty, to the, to the just an infinite amount of, of identity out there that rarely sees representation in our spaces. And in fact, also, uh, the people who make these games are often working in conditions that uh, are themselves rarely represented in our space. The problem is that the fascists and the proto-fascists have another different benefit, which is determined nihilism. There is no there there for them. There, there is no way to reach, there is no way to cross the aisle, and there is no way to wound. There is no heart to stab at. Our art in that way, and our criticism for that matter, is never going to be received by many of those people. We fire ourselves in kilns, and we work our pain and joy over like pottery, and they respond with crowdsourced memes, with thousands of hours of YouTube videos, with conspiracy charts, with carefully designed Facebook ad campaigns that perfectly target your family members, sometimes even you. Uh, with each instance of our incoherency, we are thankfully able to reach and provide for each other. With each instance of their incoherency, they reach out into the world. They are not Brechtian by any sense. They are not Marxists. They are not really even populists when it comes down to it. But because they are loud, because they understand technology, because they are willing to throw themselves at the wall again and again, they are a sort of vanguard, a sort of, again, nihilistic vanguard. And they have managed to refunction art in order to reshape society in the way that many of the theorists that we respect and draw on, many of the philosophers who we look to for guidance, ask us to do. 
So, unfortunately, today I am not feeling very much like Walter Benjamin, and I am feeling very much like Theodore Adorno. I could not feel more firmly today that games will not save us. In 2009, Eric Zimmerman wrote, hopefully, that games which require an active participation that isn't seen in film or music or any other medium could transform everyone into a game designer, and that in doing that, we would learn a sort of literacy of the world that could help lead us into a century where, where equity becomes achievable. What is a game designer, he asks, uh, and he, just, he d defines briefly in his manifesto, and brevity is an important part of all manifestos, so I do not uh, criticize him here. He simply says that game design involves, quote, systems logic, social psychology, and culture hacking. These are familiar terms to anyone studying politics in the last two years. Systems logic, social psychology, and culture hacking. If we are actually moving into a ludic century, then it may be time to reevaluate if that is a particularly good thing. When I think back to my earliest thoughts about this talk, I expected to stand here and present about the possibilities opened up to us by games, about how they could provide new methods to resist. But in revisiting my own work, in revisiting Zimmerman's manifesto and some of the work of, of other incredible critics and philosophers and theoreticians, I wound up wondering if maybe our love for the sculpture left us blind to the shape and sharpness of the chisel. The announcement of this talk asked, what does it mean to make and play video games during a time of political struggle and social turmoil? As I sat and looked at my notes for this talk and at my earliest drafts, I was left wondering why this was the question we were asking. I look at games that attempt to address our dilemmas. Many do so powerfully, but these tend to be works uh, of passion that arrive from unsustainable budgets and, through, uh, and, and to limited or no audience at all. Uh, even those that do wind up on Steam uh, often receive a limited response. I think about something like uh, Orion, Legacy of the Koryodan, which was a, an action RPG made by a team in Cameroon, which is about as far into the margins geographically as you can get when it comes to Steam developers. It's a beautiful game. It, it uses and, and draws on pan-African mythology. It has like a really neat combat system. It's a little floaty, but like it's there. The game is decent. Uh, that released two years ago. It has 59 reviews on Steam. Other games do find an audience, but they're often received as novelty or kind of lumped in with this broad category of empathy games that prevents us from really engaging with them. We just kind of go like, oh, that's a good one, put it over there. And so we end up hearing things like, oh, this is like Papers, Please, but for newspapers. Oh, this is like Cart Life, but for the death industry. Worse, we've had to face something really frustrating, which is that intention and even decent resourcing is not always enough to make games succeed at addressing the issues we hope that they will. I had so much hope about We Are Chicago, a game about violence in, the, in that city. Uh, and I, I'd hoped that it would be nuanced, that it would be thoughtful, that it would be powerful. Uh, instead, I found something that kind of offered little insight into real lives and instead felt didactic, like a pamphlet you play through. For the last few years, I've been looking forward to Riot, Civil Unrest, a game that seems to understand how and why protests often do break into violence and which contextualize that violence instead of moralizing about it. When it hits steam, the following uh, is how it sold itself. Quote, as civil crisis deepens and, in and inequality tears the, the very fabric of society, the discontentment of the masses manifests itself in violent public disturbances and civil disorder. Play as the police or the angry horde as riot civil unrest places you in some of the world's most fractious disputes. Okay, that's like not exactly where I was hoping we'd be in terms of you got to sell the game. You got to sell the game. I get it. Uh, over at Zam, Dante Douglas, uh, who is one of my favorite critics working right now, he's at Video Dante on Twitter. Please follow him. Uh, he reviewed Riot, uh, and and he wrote this towards his conclusion. Overwhelmingly, as I continued to play Riot, I found myself not frustrated with it so much as left feeling somewhat empty. Riot places itself as a as a conscientious recreation of real world protest scenarios, but couches them in systemic quote winnable scenarios. Just occupy this square for five minutes and the police will leave. Uh, it's obviously simplified for the sake of creating a more interesting game, but one wonders why these decisions were made. As I looked at Riot and I read uh, this review and, and I considered playing that and all the other things that, that do try to address these real concerns that we have, I wondered about all of our recent talk about the ability of games to do more than just offer us escape and refuge. 
whether through the discourse about formalism a few, a few years ago, or about serious games a few years before that, or about the familiar fantasy trappings that are in all of our mega hits. I look at Riot, I look at We Are Chicago, and I say, is this really better than Dragons? No offense, Frank. Uh, are Dragons really that much better than the black and white stones of Go? Um, and I want to be clear, all of this is just as true for games criticism as it is for game development and game play. Uh, you know, I look at the numbers of stories that find audiences and the ones that don't. Uh, I look at the number of, I look at our competitors and see what works for them and what doesn't. I look at something like Compete, uh, where people like Matty Myers and Eric Van Allen are doing groundbreaking work in the field of esports reporting, who are, who are kind of drawing on a heritage of sports journalism that does more than you know, provide box scores and actually engages with the culture of, co of competition, and then like see with the responses to that, which is deeply hostile from that community in a way that is so disheartening. Um, and beyond all that, I, I, I had to ask, like, why should this talk be about games besides the point that I love games, right? Like, underscoring all this is like, oh, I fucking love video games. I can't wait to go home and play Monster Hunter. But like, <laughs> but why now talk about games instead of like, anything else. Why should we discuss the state of play instead of the state of music or film or architecture or maybe even below those things, kind of deeper down, recording technologies or the surveillance state or the, the water uh, uh, crisis that is happening across the world? You know, there are cities that are running out of water very rapidly, it's something I didn't know about until recently, and like, I do my best to read things a lot, and like, I didn't even know about this until recently, and that's a, a pretty big problem. Um, you know. <laughs> Why not, uh, why not talk about zoning laws? Why not, I thought, washing and folding laundry in the time of political struggle? And I'm only half kidding. Like, you know, not a lot of people have played Far Cry 2 all set. Not a lot of people have played Dwarf Fortress or Crypt Worlds, games I love to write and think and talk about. Everybody does laundry. Even the people in the MAGA hats do laundry. And I don't think I could reach them necessarily, but I could probably reach like their family members who don't necessarily wear the hat outside of their home. Um, and it might seem like a shallow topic at first, you know, uh, but think of the connections that laundry has. You could talk about fashion, you could talk about automation, you could talk about the water shortages I just brought up. I mean, fuck it, like call for papers for the first issue of laundry studies, let's go, let's do it. <laughs> But it was actually in thinking about laundry that maybe I started to drag myself out of that Adorno-shaped hole. Pause for water, <laughs> of which I hear there is not much left. Partly, I made that connection with laundry and games because I was frustrated and it was late at night and I was doing laundry. But <laughs> partly, it's also because I can't quite separate games from laundry. Even before the Nintendo Switch became the perfect console for laundry day, the two have always gone together for me. One of my earliest clear memories, it might be my earliest actual memory, is of kind of being like lanky and held over top of a Ms. Pac-Man machine in the neighborhood laundromat when I was like five, maybe six. And I had a Spider-Man toy, like a Spider-Man action figure, and I was like chasing the ghosts around. And I was just so bored. I was so, so, so bored. And my mom didn't have enough quarters to both do laundry and also give me a quarter to play Ms. Pac-Man. And so I made my own game up. And as I grew up, I mean, that continues, right? Like when I started doing my own chores and we had, we got to the point where, wow, we like have a, a, a washer and a dryer in our, in our house, I would time myself to see how fast I could fold all of my chores, or all of my laundries, and to finish all of my chores, because I really needed to get, to get back to playing Street Fighter Alpha, like so bad. Um, and then when I got even older, when I went to college, you know, I, I, the 50 minute wash cycle was the perfect amount of time to work on my tabletop RPG campaign. Like, it's not enough to where I'm gonna fall into a hole for three hours, but it's exactly enough to design a few cool monsters and get people, ex you know, get together some ideas that will excite my players. But then I realized that the connection between games and laundry is a lot more than personal. They overlap in maybe the most important way. They are inescapable. They are necessary for us as people. For as long as there has been laundry, for as long as there have been, there's been labor, there has been play. Exploring this connection through both academic work and through his own experience working in a factory in Chicago, the sociologist Michael Burroway uh, demonstrates that wherever people go, whatever task they're assigned, we will make a game of it. His name is Burroway, and every time I say it, I want to say Burroway, because that sounds like a name to me. <laughs> his example is pretty simple. 
workers at the factory where, where he was at uh, were assigned quotas. They were making things with machines, and they had to achieve that quota to, to get paid, basically. They also were paid per piece, though, which means that if they exceeded their quota, they got paid more. But if they exceeded their quota by a certain amount, then their next quota for their next pay period would go up. And so this, Burroway says, is very clearly a game on its own. It's a game made by management that is designed explicitly to fracture the worker, to get the most out of them, and to put them against each other in competition. There, you know, you want to be the person who has the highest number on the board at the end of the week. But also, and this is where things get tricky, you kind of don't, right? Because if you do, you're going to have to do more next week to continue to succeed. In this simple example, the complexity, power, and ambiguity of games is laid plain. Uh, in manufacturing consent, changes in the labor process under monopoly capitalism, he lays it out like this, quote, games do indeed arise from worker initiatives, from the search for means of enduring subordination to the labor process, but they are, but they are regulated coercively where necessary by management. In other words, yes, games can be our escape. They can be our refuge. They can ease boredom and offer us respite. But just as military leaders allowed early Pentagon uh, computer scientists to make and play games on their big room-filled com uh, computers just so that they would get good at designing missile systems and understanding how, compu how military computers worked, games can also turn against us. They can corral us. They can usher us into the lanes designed by the powerful to keep them powerful. But like I said, Burroway also notes that these people are kind of playing the game themselves and undermining it. The people he worked with reformed that, that quota reaching into a different game, one in which they carefully managed their output according to those quotas, often working with each other so they would know where about the entire floor would be at at the end of any given week. That way they assured they both reached, uh, they they reached their assigned quota and got paid, but also wouldn't increase the, the overall or individual workload from week to week. Quote, once a game is established, it can assume a dynamics all its own. And there is no guarantee that it will continue to reproduce the conditions of its existence. On the contrary, it is possible that playing the game will tend to undermine the rules that define it. What are the conditions for the reproduction of games, he asks. Under which conditions will the game's own dynamics undermine the harmony it also produces and so lead to a crisis? This is one of those times in, in, in academics where like harmony is a bad thing because it basically means that things keep going poorly for you and keep going really well for your boss. So we want harmony to be fucked up here. Um, and so in a strange way, I kind of wrap back around to Benjamin and this, this blend of pragmatism and maybe, maybe a partial limited sort of hope. Um, in broad terms, games can entrap us. They can set us against each other. They can limit us. They can direct us to support the same inequity that we in our tweets and our conversations and in our protest chants say that we are vehemently against. At worst, that means that when we play and design without being critical, we can defend or even reinscribe the same things that we are so loudly decrying that we think we're even decrying inside of the work itself. But if we do work critically as designers and as players, if we interrogate our assumptions, if we anticipate and subvert the response of others playing, if we engage with popular paradigms instead of ignoring them completely, we will have a chance to, quote, undermine that harmony that keeps us in our place. A quick example uh, recently um, from both a recent game and a recent Twitter conversation, the video critic Chris Franklin, AKA Camster, AKA Aaron Signal, he has a lot of AKAs, I know how it is. Um, he tweeted out a couple of days ago, editing the getting over it video and depreciating how many streamers Bennett Foddy has gotten to listen to what is basically beat poetry spread out across agonizing hours. <laughs> Uh, for those who aren't familiar with getting over it, with Bennett Foddy, uh, it is a remarkably difficult game in which you guide a man who is trapped in an iron cauldron up a mountain of stone and piled up refuse with only the help of a sledgehammer and a very idiosyncratic uh, mouse control scheme. Uh, it is ridiculous and amazing, and the whole time you play, Bennett Foddy lectures you on failure and on the history of game design and on his process making the game. And the distinguishing characteristic of it is that if you mess up at pretty much any point in the game, you will lose all of your progress. You will lose hours of slow, arduous pro progress climbing this mountain. And then 
Bennett will say something really cheeky and mean about failure, or something insightful about failure that is also very cheeky and mean. Um, and you start from the beginning again. In response to that tweet from Franklin, Nick Capizzoli, who was another really great critic in his own right, uh, tweeted back, maybe I've been playing too much ultimate general, but the best way I can describe Fadi is that he's opening up a new front. Why a new front? Well, because of its difficulty, because of these punctum-like moments of failure, getting over it found success on Twitch and on YouTube, where some of your favorite streamers, like me, can be seen <laughs> throwing themselves against the wall and, yes, sitting through a lecture that they did not ever want to hear. There has been an ongoing current in some places, especially on Twitter, as always, of uh, a distaste for games that are built explicitly to find an audience on Twitch or on YouTube. Uh, I've heard people call these like streamer trash or stream trash, uh, different than steam trash, different category, uh, sometimes the same category. There's over, it's a Venn diagram. Um, and I wonder if Fadi would actually find that name appropriate, given the centrality of trash and garbage in that game. But more importantly, uh, I wonder if this is about Fadi deciding to lean in to these platforms and audiences. Instead of resisting them, instead of saying what I'm making is high art, instead of saying what I'm making has no place on the market, he in fact broadened the scope and thought about markets that otherwise would have been ignored. Actually, I don't know if he thought about that. I don't know if he thought about you, if he even thought the word YouTube existed. Who knows? Uh, but what he made engages with those spaces. And it doesn't ignore those expectations. It actually uses them and, and leverages them. And it reaches an audience that he would have never interfaced with otherwise. Games will not save us, but we can't escape them. Ontologically speaking, I don't even believe that they're particularly special. I, I have like a weird like cringe response whenever anybody ever says that the reason games are the best medium is blah, 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 or the things that games do that books don't is blah, blah, blah. It's, it's, I've always said this, but the second you begin defending the medium is the second you've lost the argument. No one says, well, movies are important because like, no, they're movies. Everybody gets it. They're movies. I've always advocated that we need to like speak from that position of authority and, and safety and not a sort of defensive one here. Um, but the thing is, and the reason I think that, is that I don't think games need to be special to be good or to be useful or productive. Um, they are as prevalent and inescapable as laundry is. They are all around us, like automation, like fashion, like water shortages. Uh, they are a locus for struggle, and we will always lose that struggle if we don't actively engage with it. It is an easy thing to do to show up to work if you are convinced that what you are doing is going to change the world. I know this because I launched a website a year and a half ago with very, like, very high goals. It is much, much harder to show up when you admit that there will be things that limit your work, that you will not always have the resources you need, or that your brilliant idea will be kind of shaved down until it fits the widest possible uh, audience, until, until it, it, it hits the broadest audience and you've lost some of the sharpness there. It is hardest, maybe most of all, <laughs> to admit that you just might not be good at it sometimes. You will pour yourself into a thing. You will spend years of your life on a project and see it hit the wall and hear the opposite response to what you expected and have it be passed around as proof of your project's failure instead of as proof of its importance. It is really hard to show up and continue doing that work those days. But changing the world doesn't look like changing the world. It looks like a long string of frustrations and failures and often major missteps that you have no one to blame for but yourself. That isn't a bad thing, it is the reality that we move in. It is the broader game that we are playing. It's one in which it is frankly impossible to know what winning looks like. But after the last two years, I have a pretty good idea of what losing looks like. And I know we can't afford to lose. Wow, amazing. <laughs> Austin.
Hi. I talked into my I talked into my water cup instead of the microphone. <laughs> um, that was amazing. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you. It's um, been a long week of writing. Yeah. And like confronting. I really wanted to show up and just have like, you can do it. Like we all need a lift, and I just didn't have it in me. Well, maybe I can pull it out of you. Let's we'll see. We'll see if we can get yeah. there. Um, you know, in thinking about this stuff, I feel a little bit like. I kind of feel like I missed the boat on, on Gamergate. Um, because you, you didn't. No, you're good. Let me, so Go at the time, I remember thinking, this is a, um, I remember thinking that apart from the issue of like fighting back against the harassment, that this was beneath contempt, right? That there was no serious um, ideas to engage with, that this was, it seemed to me ridiculous. It was like, um, you know, uh, uh, something that was, uh, not not worthy of of serious engagement, not worthy of paying attention to. And the more you paid attention to it, the kind of the more it grew. And so that was kind of my attitude about it. Um, and then um, it kind of you know I, it kind of surprised me when it in a way uh, metastasized uh, into something like you know it was became one of the tributaries of like right. the alt right, right. Um, a, 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 one of the forces of energy that 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 led to the the election of this terrible president that we are suffering under um, and and to a climate of of, of, of sort of the worst kind of, of public discourse right of of of, of Politics by meme of of the worst kind of nihilism uh, and and uh, anti intellectualism and so I feel like wow maybe I should have been uh, engaging with it more pay paying more attention to it fi fighting more more vigorously um, at the time um, and I guess my 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 question to you is whether this is just an accident of history um, that that this happened. You know, one of with its roots, you know, in games, in in like in in 4chan and NeoGaf, and or is there something about games? Is there something particular about games that makes them different from other pop culture? Um, that is a particular problem or or weakness or flaw um, that has led to this particular kind of negative right. influence. I think I would say, yes, there is something particularly wrong and particularly, uh, there was something, Gamergate was always in gaming, but I don't know that it was always in games. It was always in our moment in games history. I don't think that if you go back 3,000 years, there were people playing chess in India who were like doing the equivalent of posting on 4chan uh, and like drawing bad charts in the sand about who was who, which <laughs> chess players knew other chess players and that's why you couldn't trust them or whatever, right? Um, but I do think that in our moment in which games emerge from a culture of uh, technology and and yeah. kind of uh, kind of Silicon Valley bro startup like the the history there. I, 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 we just ran a piece on Waypoint about um, about Sierra. About we actually ran a couple of pieces about Sierra weirdly, but one of them by Duncan Fife was about Police Quest Four mm. and was about the the history there uh, in which they got uh, a a the Gates who was the the uh, police chief in LA at the time of the Rodney King uh, uh, beating and uh, the LA riots that yeah. followed. And also, to be clear, also the chief during the long period of police abuses that led up to those moments. Yeah. Um, and you take a look at some of the, the company culture that is talked about there, um, or you take a look at the last couple of days in which we've spoken a lot about the history of Atari and Bushnell mm -hmm. and, yeah. and uh, Gamergate's there, right? Gamergate's in that product cycle, in in those uh, dev rooms, in which people are literally saying we shouldn't work with these people, and then you know Ken Williams is like, no, give us good good publicity. This guy's in the news all the time. People like him because he's you know he speaks straight. It's like that's the same dude that we see today out there saying very similar things. Mm. Um, and it wasn't confronted then, I think largely because it was the dominant culture. Games were coming out of those, those spaces and did not necessarily have, the people in charge of those, of those places were not the sorts of people who could confront those things, uh, right. unfortunately. And then, I, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a quirk of history in the sense that everything is overdetermined. There are lots of causes for lots of things. And yeah. you take a look at something like Gamergate, and like, it is obviously kind of drawing on a long history of misogyny, of racism, mm -hmm. of, of a billion things. Uh, 
but also is emboldened by a sort of uh, victim complex that comes out of a culture of, of, of like a certain part of nerd culture. Yeah. Um, but also emboldened by like the ascension of geekery and like the arrival of Marvel movies and right. super heroics and like all of it just like comes together in this really weird moment. Um, so yeah, I, I think that like games in general as a thing, salvageable. <laughs> I don't okay. think all games throughout history going forward will carry this in them. Except to say that all things in all moments of history carry the baggage and possibility of all of the other terrible things that they're connected to, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it is, it is interesting that, that the, the thing that um, is sometimes pointed to as their potential and their promise right. uh, does seem to be deeply related to this, uh, this other thing which seems to, to feed the worst aspect. So, like, um, the, the promise of systems literacy right, right? the problem right. you know the promise of, of of being able to see the world um, through complex dynamics yeah. to see emergent properties to understand how how uh, a set of rules can incentivize certain types of behavior right so if you if you think about the complexity of uh, of voting districts and gerrymandering um, that seems to be the kind of thing that we could gain a deep understanding f because sure. we've played games and so and and yet at the same time that you know that 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 relationship to kind of technology and systems seems to lead to a kind of a, I don't know a kind of literal mindedness or a kind of density or or sure. lack of, well, of of understanding the nuance of human interaction. Right. So I think it's that last bit, right? Which yeah. is like, I think that you're. I think that it's completely true that I understand zoning better because I've played video games. Like yeah. I, I think that there I've played enough games to think about. Oh, okay. I could see why you would zone things this way. I, I told a story on the the Giant Beast cast once about playing Stellaris, this kind of sci-fi 4X game, uh, in which I had a, a, a population of mushroom people who really didn't like me, and so uh, the problem was that there were like a lot of them in the same place, uh, which meant that they were able to like get together and like try to push back on my policies. So I just redistricted them, <laughs> and then they didn't. They weren't a problem anymore. Yeah. They were a minority in each of their yeah. districts. They couldn't get together any sort of voting power. Yeah. So like, I get it. I actually think that's, that's true. But I think that there is a resistance for us to apply the literacy there in our lives. And I don't know that that's a bad thing necessarily, but mm -hmm. like, I'm not eager to run the sort of ads on Facebook that our opponents are, right? Like, I'm right. not super eager to use those technologies. Um, and that means that we're going to lose on that front. Like, unless we do that stuff, or unless we trust Zuckerberg and co to like reform how that stuff works, which I don't, like, I, I don't, that's a ground we're going to lose and we're going to have to find different fronts to fight on, or we're going to have to decide to yeah. come up with some alibi that lets us feel good about doing it there too, you know, uh, and, and maybe we do that, like, I don't know. Yeah, you do that, you do hear their argument sometimes. That people, yeah, people are, do sometimes say, listen, um, they just figured out uh, earlier than we did that this is the, the the best and most effective way to persuade people and to get people excited, and that we need to adopt uh, similar kinds of approaches. Um, but I don't know. I'm skeptical of that. I, I think um, it. I, I don't know what you think about that. But know. it seems to me it's, like that's not the right, uh, right way to like, respond. And this is like the weakness for us to some degree. I mean, I think there are other ways to respond. I think what yeah. it, I think that there. I do believe in a sort of. I look at things like the ways in which uh, uh, other places in the world have found a way to uh, build progressive platforms around specific ideas and policies and not just to sort of like shrugging we're better than the other guy yeah. and like, oh, we should do that. Like that's not the same as shitty Facebook ads and it probably won't reach as far, but it'll do better than what I think like the Democrats are doing right now. Right. Um, and so like there are fronts that I think we have the potential to move in in, in traditional ways. Right. Uh, and I suspect there are ways that you could convince me that we should be running a bot network also. In fact, we are probably running a bot network network also. I'm not going to say we're not. Like, of course, someone someone who believes in my political, uh, who's you know, lined up with me politically is attempting to use those same tools that like handed Trump the election uh, for, for candidates who I would support. Right. Um, but I do feel uneasy about it because fundamentally, I think we have a different understanding of what democracy looks like. Yeah. And theirs is one that's like, win at any cost. And yeah. ours is one that says like, well, no, democracy can't be the cost. Right. Right? Yeah. Um, th there's a sense in which uh, game criticism, the, th the thing you do on a daily basis, uh, is a potential model for, 
for politics in and of itself, regardless of what you're talking about, right? If you're just talking about Monster Rancher, right? Um, Hunter, please. Rancher. I'm sorry. I mean, you Monster, could be talking Monster about Hunter. <laughs> I wish, I wish Monster <laughs> Rancher was blowing up. Let's have a Monster <laughs> Rancher revival. I, you, you just, you like, I can't bother to, I can't hunt these things. I'll ranch them instead. Uh, huge, huge Monster the New, Rancher. The fun. New York elite over yeah. here. Uh, yeah. Um, but in, in the sense that, uh, you know, it, it, in some ways it's, it's like a, um, a model of politics because we have, you know, a, a, we have different kinds of values. We start from different values and different preferences and, and different lived experiences that give us different perspectives. Um, and then we encounter each other and we have a, a conversation or a dialogue or an argument uh, about these different, uh, about these different opinions, about these different values, about these yeah. different perspectives, and somehow we, through this conversation, we work it out, right? And we and we come to uh, to a deeper understanding of of each other and and the thing that we love. Right. Um, and yet again, I feel like in in games, there, you know, this has happened. I don't know if. I don't know if it's ha not happening fast enough. Maybe I'm just impatient. Maybe games are still young enough. Uh, but it it does seem like it it's there. There's there's less of that kind of rich and robust and healthy critical dialogue uh, than there is in music or, or film. Um, and instead, there's more of this kind of childlike uh, sense of of direct identification with yeah. the 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 thing that you that you've you know decided you belong to right. either it's Sonic or Mario you know either it's the the Sega Genesis or the yep, SNES that's or whatever still out. and you know what I'm saying like yeah. like that um, and that we're still kind of dragging that legacy with us, right? Yeah, totally. Well, I, I want to. The first thing is, I want to be clear that there is actually a ton of incredible criticism in the space. Yep. There is a, a lot of great discourse. I go to Critical Distance every week, read what they what they put out, like or not what they put out, but what they they aggregate, what they yep. collect. Um, there is fantastic work being done from the the kind of mass audience sphere to what still exists of the blogosphere to YouTube to Twitch. There are Twitch streamers who do incredible work, uh, and and to the academics. Space, right, yeah. obviously, um, but that is not what you're saying, right? What, you, what you're pointing at is that if you take someone who is, if you take someone who considers themselves a music fan, and you sit them down and say, "Read this review on Pitchfork or Noisy or Pigeons and Planes," mm -hmm. and that gets into a political moment or or talks about something uh, about music in a way that isn't just about is this worth your five bucks or whatever uh, from Bandcamp, like. Those there are enough readers there to make those sorts of conversations sustainable, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that they're there for games right now. Like I, I, we, I'm an editor in chief at a gaming site. I know what does well. I know what doesn't. We have tools to follow what does well at other sites, and the best writing I see again and again finds an audience. It yeah. does, but like that audience is pretty humble, um, and it's much more humble than the audience that cares about like. The the Nintendo left a hacking a message inside of the Nintendo Switch or whatever, right? And like it's a cool story. It's it's clickable. It's it's attractive. Um, or the the audience that says like, should I buy this thing with money? And I don't. I'm not you know dismissive of that audience. I also have a limited amount of money and like to be you know mm -hmm. like to be informed about what I'm spending it on. Yeah. But I I think that a big part of that resistance comes from. Uh, partially from a lack of understanding of how games are made and gaming as a as a not just a, a series of, of consumable products that you buy from a shelf, right? Like, we have, uh, auteur theory be fucking damned, we know what a director is, right? We know what a screenwriter is. We probably don't really know what a producer is, but we kind of have an idea of what a cinematographer is. <laughs> um, that's not true in games, uh, mm. by and large. Yeah. Someone knows that Miyazaki is in charge of Dark Souls. Right. But that's about it. And I don't know that they know what he does okay. on that project. Yeah, yeah. Which means that there is already, that's, and that's not the only issue. This is, I'm not saying that's why gamers, right. blah, blah, blah. But that's, for instance, one sort of lack of literacy of the work, of the history of the work, of the context in which these emerge oh, from. That's interesting. And so yeah. there's a limited uh, degree of conversation around those things. And instead, it's, I like... Mario, or right, whatever. right. There's a, there's a sense in the which the Mario fans are okay. By the way, like as far as like fans go, I say I don't like Mario games that much, and most Mario fans are like that's a shame and like awesome. I say I don't like Uncharted. <laughs> if I say like I don't like Uncharted, I whew, 
Those motherfuckers. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I think that's a really interesting insight that, 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 that in, in music and in film, there's so much of a human presence in the yeah. performance. Right. Uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the DJ or, or the, 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 the singer or the MC or in the actor, um, there's so much human presence. Um, and, uh, and, and in a way, games don't have that uh, front and center. Right. Um, Except for getting over it with Bennett Foddy. Right. In <laughs> which. Of course. Um, but, you know, and, and as a result, I mean, and there, I mean, maybe related to this is, is the sense of that we're still, f as a culture, figuring out what games are. Are they appliances? Right. right. Do you know what I mean? Right. Are, they, are they more like a toaster? Or yeah, more are they like more like a, a toaster? Right. And, and so... Um, yeah, so I think I think that's that's uh, that there could be, and then you know I, I see someone like Yoko Taro, you know, and, and I think this is uh, whatever your opinion about Nier Automata, and maybe we'll Wait, get. Did into you get this. to that? Did you ever play it last of year? Of course, yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, but to me, there's something really nice about uh, his. Uh, st status as an auteur and, and the mm -hmm. willingness of the kind of Japanese game industry to have these uh, kind of eccentric figures um, who are out there kind of representing their work as being an expression of their ideas, um, even though behind the scenes it's still, you know, it's still corporate culture. Huge, right. It's a huge team. It's a huge there team. There are character designers, there are, you know, musicians, there are all these people who come together. There are programmers whose names you never learn and all that, but at least yeah. you have Yoko Taro. At least you yes. have Kojima, right? Yeah, yeah. And and I think that that that, that that, that does give uh, something essential and important um, in framing the the work that you're that you're interacting with. Well, and there's yeah? another part of this, which is that studios are like black bo boxes. We can't you can't get into any random studio to do a, a profile the way that you would like to do that with a musician, right? Like whoever, uh, if the Roots have a new album coming out, like you will find a, a journalist who is following them yeah. during that process and who's giving you deep personal, uh, uh, you know, uh, insight into what that process is like. And it happens, especially with smaller developers in our space. But like Destiny 2 did not have that sort of embedded style of journalism happening with it because it's too, because. Why? I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I think that there's like a risk aversion, right? Um, I, why might be, have you seen how Destiny 2's fans have reacted to that game since it came out? And it's been disappointing. I'm disappointed yeah. by that game, but like there was a, a, a loudness about that. And there is, I think, for, from the publisher side, the fear that any messaging you don't control risks turning that audience against you. The same audience that is like so determined to sing your praises to high heavens will immediately fall on you, and that will destroy right. morale. And like I get it, yeah, you know. But there are, yeah, also the conditions of, of labor are so bad that you can't imagine having just like a journalist hanging out and asking people questions while they're busy trying to work, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so. All right, so let me let's let's get into Nier Automata a little bit. All right, bit, let's because, go. Uh, <laughs> it was like a year ago that we sat at a pizza place. I remember. I was like, Frank, I you well, gotta play this game. I did play it. Um, I mean, it, it was it was a game that I kind of uh, um, was uh, alerted to by the by the passion of my students. Sure, like I had a lot of students, um, especially undergrads, who were just like head over heels in love with this game, and it and I got really excited about it. Um, and and um, so I, I I did play it, um, and and I didn't love it, uh, and I found it to be. First of all, just kind of uh, this uh, this huge, bland, boring, empty uh, 3D space mm -hmm. full of incredibly repetitive and tedious combat, um, interrupted occasionally by uh, what I thought of as being a kind of uh, run-of-the-mill, you know, uh, JRPG-style oh, narrative, <laughs> you know, uh, full of kind of cliches and wooden, you know, dialogue. Um, and uh, what am I? What am I missing? And so I, I stopped. I stopped. stopped. I didn't yeah, get yeah, yeah. onto the, the treadmill of playing I, the three I or four love times that game. through. I love that game. Tell me what am I? What am I missing? You're playing yeah. it three or four times through. So you really do just need. You to, really am I wrong? Do. Am I right about that first part yeah. that it's meant to be? Yeah. A, or, okay. I, I mean, I think I think it's I think it's rough. But like I think most games are rough. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, no, I, I, I do. I, yeah. I don't, I, that was as bad as every other game I played that year <laughs> in terms of it not like moving me in the first five hours or whatever. Yeah. Right? Like yeah, these environments aren't that inventive shrug yeah like but there were enough things for me as a player immediately within those first few hours i'm not gonna get into too many spoilers here but oh, it's fine ah. we've all played near automata right yeah <laughs> see someone just raised their hand i'm sure that no, everyone on not. the internet i'm saying okay yeah, everyone, yeah, 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 fair. yeah um but like there are a few things early on in which like oh, okay i can see how they're playing with expectations here okay um and then by the time you by the time you start the second like playthrough, you didn't get through the first playthrough. Either. Yeah, yeah, I stopped yeah. after the first. If you do the first playthrough, they immediately hit you with a thing that's like, 
okay, this is, okay, you're doing something here. And then that second playthrough is, I think, maybe the worst part of the game, because oh. as much as I so love I that. to look forward to. Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Um, because as much as I actually love the, the way that, what they do with the kind of, so the, the, the perspective shifts, you begin playing as, instead of playing as 2B, you begin playing as 9S, okay. who is the operator who she's with, who like hacks into things. And it's, it's actually pretty interesting, because one, the hacking minigame is this kind of like, bullet hell, like, micro game mm -hmm. format. Um, and the music really seamlessly transitions into, into kind of chiptune and then back out to, in the hacking moments. Um, and his perspective is interesting because, like, he can read things that she can't read. And he has information about the world that she doesn't have. And it, but at the same time, you're doing the same stuff again. You're yeah. playing that same entire bit. And it's very frustrating. And you're like, OK, all my friends tell me. Here it goes. Yeah. Then you finish that playthrough. And then it gives you like a next time on near Automata. And you're like, oh, what? And then it's like all of the soldiers are dressed up as like fascist stormtroopers okay. with gas masks on. And the, the world is even foggier and uglier than it was before, but in like a good way. Yeah. And, and then you like jump into that third act and it's a completely different game. Uh, and oh. you inevitably end up playing as another character. And it, it ends up getting to a place. And I've said, this is what I, how I pitched it to you originally, is that like it is not content with our robots humans, right? right. It's it, it wants to know what humans are and like that is a much more interesting com conversation I, I do like the sound of that and I, I do intend to, to keep going to and that. I will I will play through but boy that's a that's a long time for <laughs> for a work of art to ask you I don't and know it's, and it's typical have you read like Don DeLillo like mm, yes and I guess that the first five chapters of Cosmopolis I know suck. but that's an hour and a half do you know what I'm saying? That's yeah. not, like this is and games this is long. yeah. This is a thing about games, like it and 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 it is a it is a real commitment, um, both in terms of a kind of specialized literacy and in a kind of patience and an ability to put up with 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 sort of sifting through the garbage yes. to find the gold. And and I mean, I, sometimes you you hear the the call for accessibility as being uh, like a necessary ingredient of a more progressive political totally. engagement with games. Totally. Um, and then other times, I, I don't know. I don't know if I believe that, right? I think it, maybe games are just by their nature always going to require a, a much heavier commitment. They're going right. to appeal to a much smaller kind of group. They're going to demand a higher degree of literacy. Maybe that's okay. They offer a certain joy that comes with that that harder cliff to climb, right? Like, I, I've been playing Monster Hunter, uh, not Rancher, and uh, I'm like 40 hours into it, and it's a game, it's a series I've always bounced off of yep. after two or three hours, f because I just couldn't get my head around it, it didn't I'll incentivize me. It's fine. Okay, yeah. that's, I appreciate yeah. it. Um, <laughs> But now I'm at the point where I'm learning new weapons and each weapon that I learn is its own little like spike of joy yeah. because there's so much differentiation between the various types of weapons you, you like can use. You like the axe now. I, like the, I do like the yes, switch axe now, right. I do, it's yeah. true. Um, and the that is something unique to games and that the, the entire sell is that it's gonna take me five hours to learn the thing because if I could learn it in 30 minutes, eh. Mm -hmm. yeah, what have I learned in 30 minutes? Nothing. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like that's replaceable. Uh, that that time is is nothing. And so, to some degree, I do think that there is a place for these games that are massive. But I think if you could tell me that you could snap your fingers and give me a, a near automata that was I said it, I said automata instead of automata. God that's damn it! Right. Um, if you if you told me you could give me the 12 hour version of it, I'd take that game probably. Right. I might not like it as much, but I would take it because it would fit my life more yeah. easily. Yeah. Um, and I think that this also, we could have a whole conversation about consumer expectations on length of games, especially yeah. Japanese RPGs, yeah. in which there's a long history of those games being expansive and mm -hmm. endless, mm -hmm. and, and which, in a moment like ours, I understand why you want to disappear into something for a long yep. time. I put 130 or 40 hours into Zelda last year. Like, I think it's good. I don't know that it's 150 hours good, but I needed that 150 hours. Do you know yeah. what I mean? No, it's true. I think it's, a, I think it's an underappreciated... Uh, quality of games that agree to which we often play them for comfort. Yeah. We really do. We have this relationship to games where we, we draw, and, and maybe that that is one of the ingredients that leads to a kind of conservatism, right? Absolutely. Maybe, yeah, right? maybe I mean, this, this is, idea of, oh, I need this, it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm medicating don't myself take this, for this game. I, right. I, yeah, I don't want, I don't want it to have the, the, the spiky, you know, I don't want it to be spiky. I don't want it to remind me of how difficult and troubled the world is. I want it to be a blanket I can wrap around myself to protect myself against the world. Well, and that's the thing that I wish we had a different sort of literacy. I mean, there's lots of literacies you can talk about with games, right? Um, but one of them is how do we like a thing and also be critical of it? And that's like a very intro basic thing, but it doesn't get taught to us via games, right? Whereas I, I think, 
when I read novels, a thing that happens in novels is people have problematic faves, right? Like mm -hmm. people in novels struggle with their desire for things that are bad for them. Yeah. Um, that happens in music. That's yeah. like every other love song is yeah. like, I hate you, why won't you love me back, right? right. Like, right. And games don't do that that often. It, it, AAA big budget games don't engage in that specific story. Yeah. And mechanically, I'm hard pressed to find one that engages in that idea of like this thing is hurting you, but also, or this thing is, is, is you love it, but also there are some problems with it, right? You, yes, you're pointing um, at you. No. no. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Universal paperclip. Thank you. This. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I, I got. It. That's not for me to say. Yeah. I thank you. Austin. Yes. Did you get that? Thank Universal paperclip. Uh, so now on iOS. <laughs> um, uh, is it on iOS? It's on iOS now. But but uh, you know I, I think you said a thing earlier which which I really agree with which is that games won't save us. Um, but I do think there's a sense in which it's still and, and maybe there's my slightly optimistic mm -hmm. twist on that. Playing games is not going to lead you to, uh, you know, to to a, a, to enlightenment. It's not going to improve the way you interact with the world. It's not going to give you some kind of deeper understanding or, or critical literacy of uh, or an ability to like see these hidden systems and understand the like world in a deeper like way. like the world unlocks I, itself. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I I've come to believe that um, that playing games will not do that. However, I do think there is a possibility for a for a person who's who's got a lot of games in their life and who plays a lot of games to then in the process of reflecting on that right and thinking about it and talking about it um, for for that to lead to to those kinds of insights, right? Which right, but but like, it's 2018. I think everyone in this room has the relationship you're saying. I right. suspect that the people in this room can't move public policy. Like I and I and this sounds cynical, but, but like like and it is like I I. Things are fucked but, right but, now. But like, we can, right? But we can. I, and I, like, I'm not hopeful in that way right but, now, but, Frank. But, but this is why I'm excited that, that you're the editor-in-chief of, of right, Waypoint, I'll keep right? publishing people like Dante who are deeply optimistic because I need to hear those voices. But like when I look at the ways in which corporations shape all public messaging. I look at the ways in which uh, you know our, our our most public uh, uh, spaces for discussion are unmoderated, or in fact are moderated such that the voices that we need to hear are the ones being silenced. I look at the ways in which money and, and corporate interests direct politics, and look at who has access to those things. Like it is it is a good fairy tale. I think to say that because I play lots of games and am thinking critically about them, I can move someone else's heart and can move enough people's hearts that we all show up to the polls and, and get the votes in. But if we do, if we do that, what happens? Who gets elected? Like there is a greater thing that has to happen in terms of who is running, in terms of which moneyed interests are supporting which candidates, in terms of like moving us away from this like just deafening centrism that I don't see games doing in their current state. Now if you want to tell me that games can save 2055, like, okay, but I need to see the, the, the line between then and, and, and here. Well, let me give you an example. This is sure. something that makes me optimistic. The series you guys did on games in prison, mm -hmm. right, which I found really beautiful and, and, and fascinating um, and a wonderful exploration of, 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 of how games operate in, in a, in a microculture, of, of the relationship between fantasy and, and systems and, and rules and escapism. Uh, and, and to me, that seems like a promising example of how, yeah, it, in a way it's less important what the games are themselves and, and in a way more important what we do with them, how we reflect I, I mean, on them, how we think about them. Full, full transparency, I think the difference between you and me here is I know how many people read those articles. Right, like I know how many people we reached with that versus the other stories we ran that week. I know which one of those, which it's ones of those did well. And like, I look at something like Duncan Fife's piece on Police Quest, which is I think the best piece we've run in a year. Yeah, that did well. Yeah, but it didn't do as well as a story we ran like the week before on something Nintendo did. And like that's so so concerning because we reached more people with that Fife story than we reached with m most of our other stories, but, but still nowhere near what you but, need to move hearts. But, but is it possible, Austin, that, you, that your gamer brain, right, uh -huh. looking at this kind looking of... Looking at the numbers. Looking at the metrics. Looking yeah. at the metrics, at the quant looking at this quantitatively is, is missing the importance that it's not about the numbers, right? It's not just which of these articles reaches the, the biggest audience, but it's the fact 
fact that you're creating a space in which these articles can live side by yeah, side. That's why we do it. I do want to continue overlap. doing that. I'm not quitting. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but that like, these things do speak to each other. But, you know? but, but I'm being realistic here, which is that like I know to some degree we're shouting into a void. Like I'd rather do that than be silent in the void. Yeah. I, I hope that the shout echoes in such a way that there is some movement somewhere. But I'm done lying up to myself about the degree to which publishing a single article or publishing a collection of articles can and will like save the day. Like I think what we can do is make people's lives better in the micro scale. Yeah. I know that we touch people on a, on a day-to-day -day basis in a way that is very important. Um, but I can't blow up that possibility or, or that that limited personal uh, uh, aid into something bigger because I don't see I don't see I, I can't see arguments in which those things actually do work right I see direct action working if I was like a protest leader if I was like in the streets tonight and you were going to tell me that what I was doing was maybe changing the world I think I'd be much more akin to agree with you but like yeah, like that's really what it comes down to. Is like I hope what I I hope that what we do is inspire people to take direct action, to yeah. demand more of of companies that they support and blah blah blah. But like it is it is it, it we do the work so that those things might happen one day, yeah. so that we don't disclose or foreclose the possibility that they might happen. But I'm not going to say that what we do ensures that they do. Certainly and not. and that's what we often tell yeah. ourselves when we get up in the morning is like, I'm doing this because it's going to make the world better. And in fact, I need to move to a, a place where I'm saying I'm doing this because if I don't, it will definitely be worse. Yeah. Uh, which is just 2018 to me, you know, like that's, it's not particularly noble or hopeful, but like, if I don't do that, then the disappointment is so much more like the, the carceral state, the, the prison week stuff yeah. was like, go into that with like, we're going to change the world with this. And like, people are going to take notice and people are going to pay attention and, and care about what's happening at Guantanamo Bay. You know, Trump just said he's extending Guantanamo Bay, right? Uh, like Donald Trump wasn't going to read Waypoint and be like, oh, I hadn't thought about, yeah. huh. But, but I still had this notion in the back of my brain that this was part of a project of dismantling this oppressive structure. Yeah. Um, and the point isn't that it can't do it. It's that if it does do it, there's no there's no line that I can draw between those things that is visible. And because you can't draw those visible lines, instead I need to find a politics that is not about kind of immediate effect, right? I mean, I think this is part of what's underlying a lot of what I just said before, which is I look around the world and I look at what arguments for diversity look like. I look at what arguments for a raise in minimum wage look like. And they all come down to like, well, how much more money could we all be making if we do these things? Well, how can this, how can this change the world positively out, you know, in this very quantifiable way? And in a weird way, even though what I'm doing is counting the metrics, what I want to be saying is we need to be doing these things not because they guarantee change, but because we have to do them for their own own right. Well, I have to run that. I'm going to run another prison week type thing this year. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to yeah. find another theme week that is just as challenging, hopefully, and just as thoughtful and well reported. But I'm not going to do it because I think it's going to change the world. I'm going to do it because it's worth doing on its own. You know, Eric yeah. Zimmerman in the the final piece of the the uh, manifesto says like games don't need to be justified. Games right. are beautiful, right? Right. Um, we don't need them to save us, for us to love them and for us to pursue them and talk about them. Like, they don't need to be the thing that rescues us from hell. They can be in hell with us. And, like, that's all. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Beautiful. Um, maybe let's uh, open up to the, to the audience and, and do a little Q&A to see if there's any, any questions uh, from, the, from the folks that are here. Yeah. Like, what do you think, like, I, I thought, like, the, the whole thing, what you guys were talking about, uh, with, with this whole sense of a uh, black box, um, like, mm -hmm. studio, like, uh, like, there's this whole, there's this whole thing where, where, uh, uh, companies have, like, proprietary, like, shielding, like, like, over their companies, and it's just interesting, like, to see, like, the juxtaposition between, like, Japanese companies, which, like, you know, like, really, um, when they historicize the, their, their figures, like, like, they make, like, some of the figures, like, archetypes are huge. Like, right. Like, Ninja right, right, right. And, and, and then, like, and then they, they take away, the, like, the, this whole uh, structure of... of I, I'm going to have to paraphrase this, so... So that people can hear. So, yeah, so, so give it to me as a question, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Well, yeah. well, I'm trying to, like, lead up... Yeah, the sure. But, like, like um, well, essentially, like, what I'm asking it is, um, what, like, culturally... Um, well, like, what were you, like, um, I'm, I'm just very, I'm just very um, excited about, like, you uh, bringing up, th like, this whole thing. And 
like what is it in particular the, the difference between Japanese and 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 Western like, game developers that, in this respect? Like, what is the impetus of, of like, like like why you brought, brought that up? Why I bring up okay. so, so yeah so the, yeah, the the difference between the openness of of, of Japanese versus uh, Western and like, game developers yeah and also like why would I bring that up yeah. in general like so I I mean I, I actually think that it's way more complicated than that because if you look at the history of Japanese game development like yes they do historicize certain figures in such a way that you know who Itagaki is you know who who some of these figures are who have made great game franchises but also you know when you look at the NES era in Japan you had developers using being forced to use pseudonyms in their in the credits so that competing companies wouldn't like snatch them wouldn't mm -hmm. go and try to hire them out from Konami or whoever yeah. right that's how you end up with um whose papa is it does anybody papa. what is it Yuki Chan's papa. Yuki yeah Yuki Chan's papa thank you so much it's like who's Yuki Chan's papa i don't know and that's why we can't hire him right um so i think it is more complicated than just the japanese game culture celebrates its figures and the western game culture doesn't um that said, I do think that part of it is actually if you take a look at the different press cycle or the different the different sorts of press in, in the different cultures, like if you look at uh, Famitsu is like well known to be purely a celebrationist kind of magazine, right? Like obviously they give negative reviews here or there, but there is a degree of of like early 1990s era game pro style, like rah rah video games, video games, woo, and like that's a little bit less in games culture in general in the states. Um, and so I think that there is a degree of of in the in you know the west in general suspicion that the press that that press sneak fox quote unquote will like ruin your 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 game development. And like I I get it to some degree like we run leaks sometimes, right? I reported on the PS4 Pro before it was announced. I get why Sony might not trust me. Um, but also, there are other things that I know about that I don't report on because I don't think that they serve a public good in reporting on them. Um, so, but to get to the, the kind of deeper question, which is like, why do I bring that up? It's primarily because I think if there was less of a black box around these things, we would see meaningful change in the working conditions of the people at, the, at, at major studios and also a greater influx of people who want to, to learn how to make games in their own like work conditions and in, in their own spaces, because we would be able to talk about what it means to make a game. I think we, that's improved in our lifetimes. In the last ten years, like we've seen an explosion of people making games, partially because of tools changing, but also because we've been talking about what it means to make a game more and more. Um, but I, and that's part of why I wish there were less there was less proprietary uh, mm -hmm. kind of a proprietary uh, understanding of how games are made is because I think it's an interesting way to do a thing. I think it's an interesting way to make art, and anytime you, you show me that, I'm going to be <laughs> invested, and I think a lot of people would be. Yeah, yeah. Um, any other questions? How about all the way in the back there? Yes, uh, you're 75% of the way. Um, Austin, I wanted to ask, do you think it's selfish or even unethical to make games instead of making them for instance, running for office? Like, am I naive to think that because queer games help me come out as trans and like, come out to my friends and hopefully create a bubble of opportunity? I don't think it. Uh, so there's two questions there. The first is whether or not it's naive. The second is it whether or not it's naive. The first is like whether or not I think it's unethical to do this instead of run for office right. or build houses or you know what I mean. Um, and I don't. I I'm pretty firm in the first one being no. Like I don't think we all have a responsibility to do the math and find out what the best way it is to like throw our bodies through on the cliffs for everyone else around us. I think we have a responsibility to, to be uh, ethical citizens and to be engaged in our communities and to pay attention to, to what's happening in the political world and when we have extra time and resources to put those to causes that we care about deeply and it sounds like you're doing that and so like of course I wouldn't judge you at all to do that um, and I wouldn't say that you're naive either in, in doing that. I think that that's optimistic. I think that it is, um, I think that it's a powerful motivation, one that I wish I still like had the way I did a couple of years ago because whether or not it works, it won't work if you're not doing it. Do you know what I mean? Like if your goal is to help other people, sitting on your ass is not going to help other people for sure. It might be a long shot to help other people doing what you're doing, but like you could do it. There is the chance that it hits. And I suspect that you help other people in this individual basis on a day, you know, daily. What concerns me and the, the reason that I have this cynicism is that I, that we are, we are 10 years out from seeing the sorts of issues that we all care about deeply turned into like mass market products, right? Like I've, I've, 
probably retweeted this Michael Lutz tweet a billion times, but like we know diversity won because there's more action figures now, right? And like, we don't, that's not it. That we, diversity is way more than that. It does mean redistricting. It does mean, you know, better medical uh, resources for, for, for people. It does mean all of these things that actually help us in our individual lives. And I think it's ethical to fill in those gaps with ourselves whenever we can, which again, it sounds like you're doing. But I also want to make sure that we're measured in our expectations in terms of fixing those gaps. Like, I think what we do when we try to be good people, when we try to provide for our communities, when we try to speak from the margins, is that we identify gaps in the social structure and we put ourselves in those gaps. That doesn't close the gaps permanently. What it does is like provide an example for other people to throw themselves into those gaps. What I would love for us to figure out how to do, and what I don't think the current model does, is figure out how to reshape society in a much more fundamental way so that our political voices are heard and those gaps are addressed instead of our votes being courted whenever it's election year. And so suddenly a politician says that they care about these issues and then gives us you know, some uh, a tax credit for, for something instead of actually addressing and providing a social safety net for the issues that affect your community, my community, all of our communities. Um, yeah, right here. Yeah, right. Uh, this is with regards to games criticism specifically. I feel like recently, um, and maybe this is something that has been around you know, ever since the blogosphere days, um, there's kind of this, I guess, reflex where critics kind of want to either call out or point out that a game is like problematic, racist, um, misogynistic. Uh, it, it all seems to be like a sort of value judgment. Um, that, and, and, and I, I don't want to call this out as being a bad thing because I think that's very helpful. But when we're talking about this with regards to games, there's a sort of friction in the fact that at the end of the day, we're having these conversations about you know dudes punching each other on the screen. How do you reconcile um, games as something that's like or juvenile um, with these, this reflex to criticize things and call things out at a higher level. So if I can repeat the question, how do you reconcile um, the, the sort of, I, I guess, puerile or kind of infantile quality of a lot of games mm -hmm. as, as pop culture thematically um, with, with a desire to, to sort of uh, uh, you know, hold, hold them responsible for their problematic aspects? Sure. I mean, I think first and foremost is I do my best to, when I feel that something is being infantile or, or is, is limited in, in what it's saying thematically or, or in, thematically in terms of its meaning or thematically in terms of its wallpaper, um, the first step that I take is to say like, wait a second, is that, is that really the limit of what's happening here? You, you said like, this is a game where two people or two dudes are in the street punching each other. Like, all right, like that is a way to talk about a game like Street Fighter or Streets of Rage or, or whatever. But Games have this other element that is about design, that is about mechanics, that is about music, and there are all of these other elements that contribute to making what the final work is uh, in the same way that cinematography does for, for film, right? Like, I think that if you look at uh, um, uh, an action film, if you look at something like Ong Bak or something, you're like, oh, this is just about a guy punching people. Like, okay, like, you can have that conversation, but you can also put it into a context of action films. You can look at the cinematography and choreography. You can think about how the cat with the casting decision means. You can think about how it's marketed. All of those things do ha are potent with meaning. And so while, you know, something like Monster Hunter, a game where you kill dragons is right in line with dozens, hundreds, thousands of other games in which what you do is kill dragons. The, how you do that is, is uh, differentiating and is worth engaging with. So that's, that's like my, my first answer to that. Um, the second one is that like just because the second one is that you should look at the way people responded to criticizing a, a game where what you do is kill dragons. They respond as if it is the most important thing in the world, which means it is to some degree, right? Like to, to counter what I just said, if games, if I'm saying that games will not save us, like part of what I actually do mean, and maybe it's not countering this at all, is that because they are so important in people's lives, they do have the, the potential to ruin us, right? Like, because we are so dedicated to these products, and we think of them as products and not as works, like, we do, you do see people who take seriously things that on it, their face are so plain and, and basic and simple, and, and are, you know, aren't, they don't look like what we think of as serious works from other media. Um, 
And so, but that they take it seriously means that people are taking it seriously, which means as a critic, it's my job to also take it seriously. Uh, and I think that's true even for stuff people aren't taking seriously, right? I think there's lots of stuff that is dismissed because the, again, I mentioned Crypt Worlds a, a little while ago, which is a fantastic game that looks, that, that visually would be dismissed by many people, uh, but is worth a, a critical look despite that. So. I don't know, like my, my first job as a critic is not to respond with my first impression of a thing. It's mm -hmm. to keep digging, mm -hmm. especially when I see activity from a community that suggests that there is more there, yeah. even if that activity is like painful for, for me, you know, in some way, even if it's like, oh, why do all these people like this thing? It has to turn into, okay, why do all these people like this thing? Yeah. That's what we ran a piece last year on Battleborn, a game that like I could not stand to play or look at, but like these 13 people really loved it and like that's a, it was like 57 people actively playing it and so we, we put a reporter on it who like spoke to those people and got them to talk about what they loved about the game and the community and that was way more interesting to me than another piece taking down Battleborn. Yeah. Um, yeah. You talked about the discrepancy between direct action and games. I want to know is there an overlap between games and direct action? If not why, uh, why isn't there? And if so, why is it not enough that you feel the need that there is a discrepancy? So the, what is the overlap between games and direct action? Direct action. action. Yeah. Like, do y'all want to march on PAX? <laughs> like, that's the, that's the question. It's like, so partially it's, partially it's, or like on GDC especially, like, who can afford a flight to GDC next, like, in a couple of weeks? Like, that's actually the answer for me, is many of these issues take place spread out geographically and chronologically across the world in such a way that local direct action is easier to achieve. There are enough people in New York to generate a march tomorrow, um, and, or, or to generate something like the Women's March across the world, uh, it, it, because that's an issue that applies a lot of places and a lot of times. Um, with games, the moments in which the cameras are on, so to speak, are distributed geographically and chronologically in ways that, to some degree, maybe that could help us if we actually manage to organize around them in that way. Which is to say, lots of people are going to be in Boston for PAX East in a couple of, you know, in a little over a month, right? Um, a little under a month? When is, when is PAX East? Early March, right? Oh, it's April. Thank God. All right. <laughs> it's four days this year? Ugh, fuck off. Um, so, the, the, so yes, like maybe we could generate enough, enough action in that way. And, and could overlap in that way. But, but I think the other thing is there is a resistance because people want those spaces to be celebrations or they want it to be business. They want it to be networking. Mm -hmm. People go to GDC not to protest, but so that they can like, pay their bills next year, um, so that they can promote their work, or so they can just connect with other people who do the same thing and, and celebrate it and find a way to, to explore what they do day to day in a way that they don't get to do most of the time. And so I think that that's like a big hurdle for us. Um, getting everybody there, getting everybody who often does not have the resources to travel that often into the same place, and then taking that the next step and taking direct action is a big thing. And also it doesn't help that the, the black box thing again, right? Which is like, there is, it is pretty easy to march on City Hall. I know where City Hall is, I know who the mayor is, right? But like, I don't know who is the person in charge of, like, who's, who's, who the, the office manager or who the, the, the producer is who is managing budget and time at a studio that's in crunch. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I know the studio is there, but like, I'm not marching against the workers who are being forced to, or who are being told crunch or leave, do you know? Like, and I would love for them to come out and join the direct action, but we've been over why I don't think that there is much of a culture of, of unionization and collective bargaining and all of that inside of these spaces because it grew out of this tech culture. So like, there seems to be a little bit more of a limit on it, which doesn't mean we shouldn't try to figure it out. I would love to figure it out. Um, I, I think we have time for, for, for maybe one more question. I wanna make sure that I, getting people in, in the back, because sometimes it can be hard to see. Um, how about right, right there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's more a case of the media ecosystem that exists and the gamification of information, or is it just the choice readers are making? So the frustration with you, you mentioned with the, the kind of metrics of your site of the, the you know, uh, the people who, the, the, the types of articles that are driving the well. most traffic, right. is, is it coming from the media e ecosystem or is it just, this is what this is people want? I think, the audience wants. I think it's a mix. I want to be clear too, I'm not only talking about my traffic. Like sure. you, can, you can see there are tools that you have as like a, a, in media to track 
how well a post is doing for another site. So I see when a post is doing like 15 times better than the average post. And those posts are like, this new DLC is going to drop. Or like, sometimes they are like something like the work Jason Schreier does at Kotaku that is like, here's a leak about, about Red Dead or about Fallout or whatever, right? Um, but even that is like, here's a, oh wow, what's the new information about those games, right? Um, those tend to do better in my estimation than even the sort of work that is like, here are the work conditions at the studio right now. Um, and so I think part of it is the media, media ecosystem, which is to say there's lots of information out there all the time. Uh, some of our best tools for d uh, dispensing information are also such that people don't need to click through. Like, it's a really weird thing that, that you know, if you do, uh, first of all, first of all, Facebook is the king of media. Like, I, I, we are in gaming, and so it can feel like Twitter is where everything is at. It is super not. Like, it, we do it, there's a, if someone comes to, to Vice to apply to be a, like, social editor, which is what Danica does at Waypoint, um, one of the first questions that you're asked is, like, where do you think most of Vice's traffic comes from across the board? And if they say anything other than Facebook, like, uh, this interview's not gonna go great, because, like, it's, so unbelievable. But even on Facebook, what also what ends up happening is the same thing happens everywhere, which is like the headline communicates, the headline plus the cell plus the words that are in the, the box say what the reader wants to get out of the story and they're not going to click through. Um, or a comment explains it and so they're not going to click through, they're just going to engage with the comment. And Facebook is happy about all of that, like keep them on Facebook, right? Um, so that's partly is about platforms and is about how these things are sold. But I, I, I and I don't, I don't, I don't want to speak to whether or not this is about what the qualities of readership is. Like, I have my feelings about it, and it feels bad sometimes. But also, we get lots of incredible comments, and we get lots of incredible people in our community who engage with our work in a way that is so meaningful to me and so powerful. They engage deeply. They critique us in ways that are are like important and hold us to our to be our best selves. And like I can't say enough positive things about about those people. So I know that there is an audience there that is engaging seriously and sincerely. But I also don't know that there is I don't know that there is we've taught incentive to reading, for instance, long form criticism. Um, there is a subgroup that loves it. We just ran an incredible piece by Liz Ryerson on a Doom mod called uh, Alt, A-L-T, um, that is so worth reading, and I was so happy it, it did find an audience. It found an audience that was bigger than I thought it would be, and so like that was really heartening. But it's still, again, like going to always inevitably be a much smaller audience than Rockstar Delays Red Dead Redemption 2 by six months, yeah. and like that's that can be that can be really disheartening. I you know I think a lot about uh, what it means to be a, a public intellectual in the world of games uh, uh, to sort of provide a, a, a richer context or a deeper understanding to to people outside of our particular community uh, that we understand. We spend a lot of time thinking about this art form that we love and this complicated and difficult, these, these works and, and, and how they resonate with the world at large. When I hear you talk, Austin, it is amazing. You are so smart, you're so thoughtful, and you're so articulate. Um, I, I, get, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited that, that you are, you are you're at Waypoint. Um, you're also very active in, in all kinds of, of you know, media. Um, but I guess my question is, do you get opportunities to to speak to a wider audience, to speak to people outside yeah, of games? Yeah, sometimes. And, and yeah, I mean, like uh, shout outs to to like the Vice Comms department who like emails podcasts like that are not in the game sphere and like, oh, you should talk to Austin about games in 2018, and then I like, end up on NPR for five minutes, and I go like, yo, Far Cry Five looks a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and like, yes, so I, yes, and I think that that's maybe that's yeah. part of the larger conversation too yeah. about games is like. Part of how we shift that conversation is to, I mean, part of the, the whole plan with Waypoint was to reach a crossover audience. Yeah. The audience that would just as quickly read, uh, you know, a great piece of journalism from Vice Sports or from Motherboard about, about you know, e the, the politics of football mm -hmm. or about the about e-waste. We'll read about, you know, the, the amazing story behind Police Quest 4 and yeah. Rodney King, right? Like, and... That is that has been true. Like yeah. I think that that audience has responded in a way when we do provide that sort of incredible crossover content. Yeah. And but what I'm not sure it does. What you what we really need is, and maybe this comes back to the, the question of accessibility, which is like, I can tell NPR that Near is dope as many times as I want. Like 
the people who listen to NPR who are not already playing games are not going to have a good time if they pick up Nier. And yeah. there are games that they will have a better time with. But even then, like even I think about something like um, What Remains of Edith Finch, like if I put that in front of my stepdad who's never played a video game, I don't know, and but but loves those sorts of stories, right? Mm-hmm. Would watch the HBO original series that mm-hmm. was What Remains of Edith Finch, where each episode is an anthology series. Obviously, we should leave and go pitch this to HBO. Yeah. Uh, I bet Annapurna has already done that, actually. Um, but the he wouldn't know what to do, right? Like, he wouldn't yeah. understand that, like, oh, WASD, like right. I can move around. He'd end up in a corner. He'd end up in a corner, yeah, or yeah. wouldn't understand why one thing is interactable and another thing isn't. Right. There are all of these things that we, we've learned, and so I, I, I think part of that is a difficulty of, of bringing people in, and, and part of that's being fixed just by time, right? We've yeah, a lot more I, people are growing up with it, but... But I can't help to think that that is, it's good, and I, I, that five minutes on NPR right. is valuable. I hope it turns in to 10 minutes and then 20 minutes. And I, I would love to see you on TV, you know, on, on, on the talk show circuit. I'm really right. serious. I think, I I think you, it, Frank. of all the people I know, who, 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 who I feel like should be out there. Catch me on Good Morning America talking help, about nihilism. Yeah, just, just, helping, just helping the people who aren't in this room and who aren't on this stream, like understand, just get a glimpse of what's going on in this world, in our like world. The, I just, that's, the thing I, that's that what I want to say. wild to me yeah. is that if I did that and was trying to be this ambassador yes. for games, yes. one, to some degree, I would always be in a state of lying, like all ambassadors, in which what I'm doing is not talking about like the shitty people who would, after my appearance being an, being an ambassador of games, like, pass it around to show that I was a cuck. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And like, like I do, okay, I'm just yeah. pretend that that doesn't exist and I'm just gonna be here to talk about how dope games are or how interesting they are or whatever. And so it's, it's a, it is a compromise always when you move into those spaces. Yeah, but I think if there's anyone that could do it and, and not lie and, and, and be truthful and be honest about the complexity of this, I, I do think it's I you. I wanna it. encourage you to do that more. And, and I want to thank you for coming here tonight. Thank it was you for amazing me. I had to a great have time. you here. Austin Walker. It was amazing, dude. That was, thank you so much. That was fantastic. I had a great I really time. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Austin Walker.